Hello, welcome to Soundcheck, the all-new music and chat show with me, John Robb, and tonight's guest, Steve Adge. Steve, John. the legendary Steve Adge, the tour manager of the Stone Roses, manager of the Coral, co-manager of uh, Seahorses, the biggest CV in Manchester probably, but you're actually writing this all down in a book, which I think is due out next year, isn't it? I want it out next year. I'd like it to come out uh, three score years. I'd like to come out on my 60th birthday, 12th of May, <laughs> usually a cup final day, but whatever. That's when I'd like it to come out. If it can be done in that time, that'll be fine. So the, the book itself is, I mean, it's obviously a book of your life. Mm -hmm. and a large chunk of it will be the Stone Roses, I guess, won't it? There's a lot of Stone Roses stuff in there, a lot of coral stuff that I'm just dragging up. A lot of um, the turn of the turn of, uh, of, uh, of industry, really, the way that I, you know, I, 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 was, I was born, it was all black and white. The whole city was, was just so, and now it's technical, isn't it? It's just technical, the whole gaff, and it jumps. And I've been lucky to witness that, the change from Thatcher times, strikes and everything, to just this, just this, this phenomenal gaff we live in now. I mean, I mean, a lot of people talk about the Manchester bomb being the turning point, but I think for us in the music scene, I, I think it was the music, and I think the way it went into Technicolor probably was part of that time that you were really involved in with, with the Stone Roses thing. I think that was, that, that was the key when Manchester got that confidence back, didn't it? Yeah, we were, well, we're, just, we, we were tired of being told you have to go home, get home at half ten, get yourself in work tomorrow. It's just like, it's not the temperance movement anymore. We'll do whatever we want. Mm. You know, and the Roses were key in going, we want to play things that are different. So we put on the warehouse parties for them. The first warehouse parties before the raves that were done later on, 18 months before really, before E and the Hass really. Well, the Hass was, no, the Hass was in flow, but actually hadn't hit by then. So it was like a time to do something slightly different. Because you were actually the promoter of the warehouse parties, weren't you? Yeah, we just, all we did was, it was so simple, it was so easy, it was so gullible. I'll tell you what, this country was so gullible at that time. They'd give you 60 quid to get you off the dole, so we just formed a record label called Blackmail Records. We had no money whatsoever, so we just cut out the letterhead out of the local paper, just like a ransom note, and just put Blackmail Records on it. Took, photocopied that down at Spirit Studios, and then just took that to everyone, everything that we needed, a PA company, a venue, hire, we got all the arches just with this one bit of paper. And it was just dead easy. We even, I got a bit worried, you know, towards the time we were putting the gig on because we had no way of, what if someone died in it, you know what I mean? We were flying by the seat of our pants mm. and we were a little bit, you know, we were rushing about a bit is the best way I can put it, you know what I mean? Pushing our eyeballs back in our sockets to get through the day. But we put a stage in down, down on Old Temperance Street there. And just prior to it, we put on a, we just bought some public liability. We got a million quids with a public liability for 80 quid. Mm. Just with this bit of paper. It was that easy, honestly. That, that's actually surprisingly professional. It is. Well, we were. You know, we're not being daft. We were, I, was, I was nearly, I was 29, 30 then sort of thing. Um, and it was like, it was just a way, way of, we, we stretched it out. We didn't tell anyone where it was. It was all word of mouth by just heads in town. And we didn't, and it was called the garden. It was called the, um, the flower show. So I just put it in the gardening section of the evening news on the Friday where it was going to be on the Saturday. And it was all dead close to the city centre. But Temperance Street then was not the entrance to Piccadilly. So it was a little bit quieter. The taxi rank was on the other side. So it was quite, you know, up near the Star and Gar. You played Star and Gar many times. So up near there, and I, me and Michelle, who was my partner at the time, we shot off to get some change from Blueberries or somewhere like that, where she worked at Devils. And I said, no one's going to turn up anyway. You know, it'll be, it'll be rubbish. We've got no pound coins but, or anything. But they did have that crew that formed round, didn't they? Oh, the, we had the kind we had, of schoolboys would go and see them at that point. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's, there's a crowd of fifty who was definitely going to turn up. Yeah. But it's a big warehouse, wasn't yeah. it? But yeah. But then it just went mental. It went peas and lentil. It just mm -hmm. went, we were driving back and just a massive crowd of people walking up. But we'd put it on later, because we knew that the old bill would be stretched dealing with football and the normal turning out of the clubs and bars around town. We put it on and it was just going, it just went great. The band arrived and it hit like, like an house on fire, like an attack on the senses. It was just brilliant, a dusty gaff, a pound for a can, all your mates, no trouble, no trouble. You know, all different types as well. You know, punk skins, all sorts of things in there, goths, and then... Um, the Stone Roses is quite a different concern then as a band, musically, it's a five-piece band. Five-piece band, yeah, yeah, yeah. They sound different now, they're quite tough, they're more of a punk rock yeah, it was a punk band, rock they? Yeah. Thing. Dead, it was so aggressive, so... Mm. I've got pictures that are going in the book from that time that people... Luckily, my brother caught loads of it, and Sue Dean caught loads of that time. Some great pictures of the band leaping in the air, like mental stuff. Mm. And then my brother walks up and goes, yeah, all right, kid, the old Bill are outside, it's on top. Like, it's like 30 of them in vans. <laughs> And they want to see who's in charge, they want to see it now. So I've pulled myself together, got me little bits of rubbish paper, walked outside and sat there, just went and knocked on the front window of one of them. It just went, I walked outside from it, it was like chaos inside. I walked outside, it was the time of the morning, about 2 a.m. or something. And all you got was the odd roll of a train going past, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that smell of diesel and all that. And so I still remember it now, and there's like a load of long sight diamonds on the floor where a car's been done in. I walk up to the lead block, 
and knock on the window and he winds it down and I just went, uh, what are you doing? And he went, whatever you are, kid, disperse. He looked like he should be having a fagging long side by then, do you know what I mean? He'd had enough. Disperse this lot and get on your way. I went, this is an official Blackmail Records video shoot. Showed him the paper. He threw it like that. I was looking at it and I could just hear the crackle of the radio going in the background and pushing my eyeballs back in my sockets. I'm not kidding. And then I get pull out the ace, the trump card, the million pounds worth of pipe, public liability, and I just showed him the noughts and went, you stop this and I'll see, I'll sue you for that amount of noughts, mate. Not the, not the eight quid amount of noughts. And he just went, wound his window back up. He cackled for a little bit and he went, I heard him go, yeah, no, it's a film company. So he went, go back, leave two lads looking after him, so no me manners him. And he just shot off and left us and just woke up in, in the morning, come around after, after people are asleep, we woke up, put all the stuff down off the band of play about eight o'clock in the morning. These two coppers pulled up next to us, I thought, oh, we're in lumbered here again. And they just wound the window down like young kids and went, when's it on top of the pops? And it's that easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it took me like 10 minutes for one That was grief that we've struggled tonight, really, really struggled tonight. Mm -hmm. Should we do another one? Took about three seconds. Yeah, dead right with mm. And then we did certain ratio after that and carried it on. Got away with about five until I got the phone call off someone I up at the old bill going, you, to put one more of them on, I'll have you. So we did one more, then we stopped it after that. And eventually stopped us by pulling us in Albert Bridge House and put the tape recorder on for tax. Because that's a real measure, like I was saying before, how different the city centre is, yeah. how it is. Because you won't even notice that no. going on now. When no. you were there, it was deserted, even on a Saturday night. It's hidden now, or the yeah. other one just off, off um, Derry New Road, there's one around the back and it's an old garage where there's, it's just the pit where they used to fit trucks, is the bar. And it's just mayhem, there's two kids on the door, two blokes on the door, there's no grief, they're just having fun. Mm. You know, I come back from Liverpool from Nick Power's wedding and went, went and got in a taxi with these blokes. And then we got back to it and I went, what's this? And I went, Shark Club, it's amazing, it's what <laughs> we did. But now, I mean, we should have blue plaques where we did all this, not yeah. just us, but yeah. where everyone else did stuff, because that's brought, half of these kids that come to university here, which has boosted the industry, mm. because that, that's what attracts them. Okay, Manchester, when I was a kid growing up in Blackpool, <laughs> Manchester had the reputation being this really grim yeah. place. And was, after that period, it was yeah. a party town, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it went mad. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like stag do heaven now, isn't it, and all that. Mm. And part of that is down to the fact that the Hacienda, and all those sort of people, and ourselves, and the Donnellys who did all the rave mm. stuff after, that's yeah, it wasn't just, you know, people <coughs> say it's like the Hacienda or, or, or Tony Wilson, who's brilliant, but it yeah. wasn't just that, it was a whole... It was a whole thing, the whole of Manchester things. kicked on yeah. and just bounced on for I'm not going home at half ten. Mm. Why? Do you know what I mean? I was a plumber till I was 22, I didn't want to go back to that. Mm. I worked in a rehearsal space and it wasn't because I liked pulling your gear out of your room at half ten at night or something the rehearsal like rooms where you were. The rehearsal rooms yeah. in spirit. <laughs> we did it because, um, we, after that we did that because then you're in town. We lived mm. on Asley, you know. 11 miles away, so I was in city centre then all the time, which is, I'm a townie really, I always have been, from Gorton originally. So, so from the rehearsal room, from Spirit, is that where you first met the Roses? Or, yeah. or was it that time there was yeah. a bit of a fight at the Poly or something? Oh, no, there was That's a fight, that was Brown, someone, someone, someone had a go at Ian in there. I'd, I'd seen Ian before. But, was um, he quite a striking individual? He's a striking individual, yeah. and he's a cocky kid as well, you know, I mean, he had that swagger about him even then. But yeah. some, like a bigger gang of lads were like, picking on a little bit and I just walked over and went, you're right, and there's a load of us, like right firm of us, and they just, they just left him. But then they came into the into the studios and they had one room, you had another room a bit further down, and I just loved that stuff that came out of that door. Mm. It was like, got me right away, it was what I was looking for. And it took me back to the thrill that I used to see like etched on my brother's face where they'd come back from Wigan and all that on the Sunday because they were a generation above us. Uh, and they were just like, they just had that. That wonderlust, they'd travel, they'd dance, they'd fight, they didn't care, they'd come home. Is this when he went to Wigan for Northern Soul? Well, but yeah, yeah well yeah. not. And that was your what I, was a soul, what we, Yeah, but that's yeah. what we were trying to relive. I was a bit young for them. I, that's what we were trying to relive. They, they say we built this city. This city's built on steam and coal, but I think it's built on Northern Soul and Acid House. And yeah, yeah. That's what built this town without fear of it out. Oh, it's helped. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm coming from. And, that's, and I think the, the warehouse parts were just my bit of trying to grab what had gone before me. So, so this initial band, when you first went into the rehearsal room, was it was a dynamic already there? Of that it way was that the energy, is? it was pure, yeah. just pure energy, aggression mm. that came out. It just it's quite interesting now when you talk about it like that because it's, it's quite a different thing. But sometimes, even at, um, when I was watching them uh, this summer, you can yeah. still see a little bit, can't oh, you? Oh, it's there, yeah. definitely. And yeah. it's there, it's there in most bands, I think. I think what, what you've got to do is let them do it try and control it if it's kicking off a bit too bad. You can't, you couldn't do that with the roses. We're just like a van full of acid filled mm. monkeys everywhere we went. <laughs> they just caused trouble. And I've just been picking up little bits from my book about things that we got away with. Loads of different careers have stemmed from there. Easty and I would do the front of house. We were in, I think it was in um, Norwich. We're in Norwich at the, uh, at, the chat, at the craft centre there. And I got a bed at about 
half two in the morning. But there's all sorts in there, you know, it's for adult education place. And I'm woken up by Johnny Squire that just covered in slip like that, from, a, from a clay thing going, Ad, you're a plumber, how do you fire up a kiln? And I've just gone, no. But that's the first now that Easty threw a pot, I think, and now he's a successful pot. So there's many different careers have come up from there as well. <laughs> it's just a, a very interesting time. We get away with murder. You know, you, the old yeah, building yeah, didn't have anything. Well, that's any. the thing about them, that, that band is completely out of control, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. but... It's, it's not, it's not a very conventional career, is it? This no. No, but I, st I still managed to have three kids, do you know what I mean? And, uh, mm. and bring them up well, they're all, you know, they've all come out all right of it, slightly scarred probably, but they're all right, no one will uh, <laughs> no say them to so them. Was the whole thing there with, with the band, was it like a gang, you know? It's a mob. Yeah. yeah, like the Mondays were a mob. Mm. It's, like, it's, it's a group of people and it was a mob, you know what I mean? And if anyone had, once the band were on stage, because all I did was drive a van at that time, do you know what I mean? My, my, you had to hit the ground running, when the roses, they sort of, they sort of bounced quickly and you had to sort of have your wits about you and hit the ground running with them. You know, when they get down to do the, 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 the BBC thing where, where, where the, where the uh, microphones went off, all that sort of thing. Ian was sharp on it when he was staying on it. Amateurs, amateurs, he was on it. Like, mm. You had to be that sharp with the band. When they came off there, they went into um, Kilroy's set and, and like, run around there for a bit and nicked a few Baker-like phones off somewhere else. Get a right laugh. <laughs> the whole day was a good day. Yeah. So, so, so when you look back at that period, I mean, what, what, what does it feel like now? You know, you're writing it up. Do you, uh, it's emotional to be truthful because it's funny as well it's funny it's, it's amazing what you can get away with do you know what I mean you learn so many things that during that time that you've used later on in life this this country was a sieve then an absolute sieve no wonder we got bombed everywhere we used to jump in and so, out so we'll pick this up in a minute then Steve yeah, yeah, yeah. in part two I'm back on the sofa with Steve Adge. I've never left the sofa, but you've never left the sofa. <laughs> quite, in, quite literally in life. Yeah, well, in actually, life. you have left the sofa an awful lot. You've come around the world several times. I have. I've been on the, the planet. Yeah. So, so what I want to get to on the second part of this interview is, I mean, you started this with the warehouse uh, parties. There were those warehouse gigs, so yeah. crucial in the Stone Roses story, and this idea that all, as, as much as they could possibly make it happen, their gigs were events, weren't they? Yeah. So you know, you, you go from the warehouse gigs. To, to Blackpool, and the yeah. Black, Blackpool's like a moment, it's an incredible gig. There's one before Blackpool, there's, uh, there's um... And there's, the international. Uh, well, there was international gigs as well, which was a step forward, but there was also Northampton Roadmenders, which was the first time I'd w looked from the stage, looked down, and just saw wall to wall, front to back, bounce. It was just E, they, they were E'd up. Was this, it. was this the 80, spring 89 tour? Yeah, yeah, and it, it was bang, and I yeah. was like, wow. And then it jumped on to Blackpool from because there. Because that tour's quite because I spoke to a lot of people when I did my book about that tour, and you said at the beginning of the tour, there'd be, like, there'd be 20 people from Manchester there with the flares on, off the heads. Yeah. Uh, 20 sturdy locals going, what's this? And there's a cultural yeah. Uh, yeah. gap on there, yeah. but as the tour went on, it sort of caught itself up. Caught itself up, and the papers, and the, you know, and the whole buzz sort of um, picked up on that, really. But it was Blackpool, I suppose, where it went, just went, Colossal. Well, Blackpool's the same, one. It's, it's yeah. three thousand the Empress Ballroom holds, and they've been playing hundred capacity venues. Yeah. And they suddenly played this three thousand capacity place. That took a nerves of steel to pull that one off. To pull it off, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And the band were phenomenal that night. And there was a bit of a sad moment, and, I, and you'll have to, mm. I, I, uh, you have to stay with me on this because I can't. Unfortunately, I can't remember the lad's name. But the lad who supplied half the ease at the Roadmenders Club hung himself or killed himself mm. before Blackpool because he never came. So that was like a sad moment on, of, on such a massive night, you know, after it. Mm. It's like a bit of a downer, really, to be truthful with you. I remember being back at the hotel afterwards yeah, and everybody was, you, you went in there thinking everyone would be like really yeah. buzzing. And he died, he'd killed and himself. The atmosphere was really flat because yeah. of this, well, understandably. Yeah, yeah from yeah. that. And it's just, well, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry I can't remember his name. Manny would tell you in an instant, you know what I mean? Because mm. he can do that in any language, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> he picks it up wherever he goes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a, a pivotal moment, Blackpool. And then from there, it, to be truthful with you, our camp always knew that that big gig would happen, then this, it was, it was taken for granted that Top of the Pops would be coming next, and this would, it was just taken for granted. It was just like that from the very beginning, yeah. I mean, just where, new. Where's this self-belief come from? I've always Dem, figured, I think. Just, Ian's always been a really confident person. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, is it from him, or, or is John? I don't know, from all of them. From all they are quietly confident. Yeah. Look at yeah. Manny, Manny wasn't at the first warehouse buy, but you know, he, you knew it was complete when he'd come in and he flicked his hair and he'd come through the door, you yeah. know what I mean? That, that was, yeah. meant the night was on. I mean, Manny, I've, I've only met Manny before that when their, their mob had a fight with our mob in Pips and one of his mobs stabbed my brother, allegedly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Is that like a Manchester handshake at the I time? Mean, it was a bit, but it, it didn't seem for years. And then 20 years later, Manny went, that's that kid up there in Shortland who stabbed your Mark and I was out of the car chasing him up the road. The kids right. dropped his shop and legged it. <laughs> but, you know, that's what it was like. Manchester was like that then. Yeah. So we didn't bother. If we went away and you said there was only 100 kids at a gig, and if some of them were just locals that were just going there for a fight, 
and start slagging the band off, we'd go in the crowd and crack them. Preston. Preston, we, just went, we fought yeah. half the town that day. We had to leave by the back door, we fought half the town, but they were slagging the band off. But Ian was brilliant, Ian was that confident. He'd have a massive long lead on his mic and he'd just walk in the crowd and sing to him. Do you know what I mean? We were at McGonagall's in Dublin, which is a heavy rock, walked in there and they just all had long hair, all doing that mm. status quo dance. And I just looked at him and went, we're going to die here. One of them was sat on the side of the stage, just looking ready, and just bent down and kissed him on the forehead. He was yeah, on, yeah. off the right, off the rail. Let's break broom handles up in the in the cloak room, which was the dressing room, to fight our way out. Yeah, it was that heavy. Oh, McGonagall's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got paid early to get him off. But if we give you the money now, we get him off. Went, yeah, chip. Let's chip, and we were out and gone. But yeah. that's, just, that's how rough it was. But you know, great times on the way there. Pitch and toss on the poop deck of the ferry. You know what I mean? Upstairs, chucking in a rolling gale. Like it was like what's it? Um, it's like what's it? You know the Atlantic. Uh, what's it called? Uh, where, they're, where they're up in uh, Seattle and from Seattle, but they're up in there, uh, in, in north, the north of America, and, and the, the ships are all rolling. And all. It was like that, but we were playing pitch and top mm. on, the, on, on the poop deck. It's fun, just them pitch moments. Pitch and toss. That's a seventies thing, isn't it? Mate, just yeah, two yeah. against thing. Just funny. Yeah. And those sort of things. I only get into a gig and they'd go. It's like a local band playing in the in the park, and they go, "I just go and get the microphone. Tell me we're playing tonight." And I'd go on and go, hi, oh, you've got some cute uh, lads from Manchester tonight. If you'd like to come down to McGonagall's and catch the Stone Roses, fresh new sound. In the, in the middle of the Troubles. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It was all that, but we, we went to Belfast and and there was like both sides of the sectarian divide were there at the gig. It was just, just immense. Never had a bad night there in my life. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Saying things like, no wonder our lads get killed because we're following a pig in our Manchester 0161 on the front of the van from Stamford Caravan. Why, you know, one of them got shot, they've not spotted us, and someone went, look at the back, and there's two out the top with the guns pointing at our van. Went, that's, why the, that's why they've not done out. <laughs> that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But just, just having fun. And, like, and all the kids were the same that came at the gigs. And Blackpool was just a, like a congregation of that, wasn't it? Or worship, and it was brilliant. It was amazing, wasn't it? I yeah. remember bounced. Getting into town that afternoon, it was just full of kids with flares on. Yeah, man. It was a youth quake. Was, yeah. You know, just a moment where it, everything suddenly became that thing, didn't it? It did. It yeah. did. You, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't walk down anywhere without someone having a rosy shirt on, could you? Yeah. It's still one of the greatest gigs I've ever been to that. Yeah, it was mega. It was mega. Yeah. But I never got, I never got toffee apple after it was belting. Yeah. <laughs> Good old Blackpool. Good old Blackpool. So, so after that, there, there was Ali Pali and Spike yeah. Island. I mean, Ali Pali, when you were actually there, was, it was a great gig, but the greatest bit was the sound check. I thought the sound check was probably the best I've ever seen that band play. Because everybody steps forward, don't they? Mm. Uh, gig. Once the gig comes on, like your sound check, everyone stood around, it's quite empty. So you've got the delay towers halfway, like, halfway down the back. Mm. Yeah. So as soon as the band come on, everyone moves forward, the delay towers just bouncing off the back walls, screaming back at the stage. Chaos. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I've, I've got other memories of that night, like a car, one of our cars with the money in, with all the money in from the takings, just, it's got a really large curb at uh, Ali Pali. And the then manager went, don't let anyone use your car at all, that's just for the band. And he set off with all the money. And then come back two minutes later, because he'd gone around the corner and took the wheel off. Come back with the box of money, went, I need your car, went, you can't have it. He told me it's just for the band, so we had to go on with all the roadies. It just stuck under a seat. Yeah. But to do that gig, to do Ali Pali, we had to come back from, uh, from filming Fool's Gold over, oh, over on the island, yeah, yeah. where they wouldn't let, us, wouldn't let us bring the gear back. Because the bloke at the customs office hated him because I'd gone out and said, you know, we want it, we want all our gear. They said it'll be three days before you get the gear, but we had a video to shoot. As soon as we started shooting, they come and got us, said you're filming on a national park. So we said, that's it, turfed us out. We just went away and bought generators, hired generators, and bolt cutters, went into the national park at night, cut it open, and that's why you see the video go from light to dark halfway through, because we couldn't film during the day. And when they turned up in the morning, we'd done. Mm. And that bit where they're doing the exaggerated walking along the top, just a little bloke in a cabin at the bottom going, uh, yes, yeah, so you have to pay to go up there. We just <laughs> nodded at him and drove up the hill because he was old. Got to the top of the hill, they did their, their walking about while he was walking up to tell us we couldn't do it. When he got there, we'd got to be done and we'd gone. That's how it was done like that. And then they wouldn't let us bring the equipment back. So we just got the record label and just pushed it all up to check in and just went, they got, have, you, have you got any excess baggage? I went, yeah, this, like nine flight cases, like 1,900 quid. Just get your credit card out, pay for it. And that's how we did it then. Mm. It worked. So, so, so it's all the time, there's a lot of, lot of problems. Yeah, <laughs> but good problems, yeah. it's just like... But, you, but the Rosie just bulldoze away through them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, step aside, we're coming through. So what was Spike Island like for you then? Uh, was that a see, really unbelievably easy day for me? You know, everyone goes like, oh, the helicopter that's flying around, that's bringing the band. That was one of Gareth's mates who had a big... I was told to take any video cameras off anybody. I arrived with the van in, in a car... Uh, no, in a, with the band in a car, as usual, before they were going on. We parked up the other side of the locks, walked across, 
just as we were going in, the band went, yeah, and just gave me all the tickets they had left. And I just walked around the front, and all the locals out there just went, hold your hands out, and just went bang, 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 there from, the, there from the band. Then I walked in, they got them ready, I blew up the, the globe, at the back, behind the amp, gave that in later on, um, and that was my day, it was dead easy, I remember come off. It was What's it. the atmosphere like in the car on the way to the gig, is, it, is it people oh, nervous yeah, no, or people buzzing or? They're, they're, they're normal bands with that band, ultra confident, yeah. they know what they're doing, they're all talented, mm. it's massive, it's like, it's like a coming together of like-minded people in it, huge, like the warehouse party but in an absolute huge stale, then you bounce it on again to Eaton Park. Mm. Because, I mean, Heaton Park, of course, is a much bigger gig, but for Spike Island, bands like that didn't play gigs that size. Yeah, exactly. No I mean, there's a lot of pressure, isn't there? Yeah, a lot yeah. of pressure. But, but I'll tell you what, what got me about that was, the first time I'd seen like, the professional side of the industry coming in, they'd go like, the slight, in, the slight incline, you know, they always sort of use an amphitheater, don't they? If they can, there's a slight incline, the stage was built, and the lighting guys and the uh, visual guys who were looking at the sight lines went like that. What we need to do is build the stage here where your ramps are at the back. We need to build ramps so you walk up to it. And they went, why? And they went, well, because as you walk away from the front of the stage, no one can see you. And that was the first time I'd sort of seen, seen that. And then there was a lighting guy who'd sat there all night crossing stuff on a computer. I'm a Luddite, mate, you know, I don't, mm. I don't do computers. And he was just crossing things. And he's the one who filmed it in the end. He's the one who stuck it. But my proudest moment that night is, a, is a, one of the drivers called Harry. And uh, he just come up to me later on and went, Stephen, can I take some photographs? I want a photo pass. I went, yeah, yeah, just wrote one and got it. And it, he rung me up the other week and went, you're doing your book, aren't you? I went, yeah, he said, I took three shots that day. He said, Steve, you can have one of them for your book. And they're just from a lighting stanchion. It's just astonishing. Do you know what I mean? So that was a little bit, I'm getting a gift back for something I did. The lighting stand, all the photographers stood on that wobbled around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of that gig was very bolted together, wasn't it? Oh, it was a lot of bolted together. Yeah. There was a lot of that at, at um, Ali Pali, the, the uprights to the lighting rigs wouldn't fit the cross section, but there was mm. some blokes fixing. Same thing again with the roses think on your feet. There was some scaffolders doing work at the top, and I just walked over, and they were all like that, looking out, you know, it's not it's not as if we're, we're up in space and, uh, you know, Apollo mm. 13's broken, you've got to make that, that air conditioning unit out of a cardboard box, a square peg it around all. Oh, they just went over and after scaffolders to scaffold some bars together, and they went, yeah, we'll do that for you. Mm. And it went quickly. Because I, I know, like I said before, you were officially the tour manager, but this, your role was bigger than a tour manager, really. But you can't say that back, say No, you can yeah. say whatever you want. Yeah, no, you always I, felt like you were actually the manager, in a sense, to me. I, I had to do bits of management when, when Gareth went and before they got mm. anybody else. Do you know mm. what I mean? The best manager in the band I've ever had is Moran and, and Connor at SJM mm. and Dave Salmon, don't forget him. It's, it's actually weirdly quite professional now, the whole thing, isn't it? It's unbelievably yeah, professional yeah. now, which is, which is how, it, if it had been that in the, it wouldn't have been as much fun in the first place, because mm. it's a bit sterile, you know. That when it's all planned out for you, you know where you're going. And on that 2012 tour, which is the last one I did, due to me getting a new artery, um, <coughs> as soon as I landed anywhere, he'd go, where are you going? I'd go, Mooch, you've never been to Mexico before. And he'd, and he'd just go, that's all you do, innit? I went, yeah, just get on a bus and just go where the locals go, and that's what you do, you feed off them. Never get in any, you never have to jog anywhere in the world. Just give him the nod, Ian will tell you, I'm Frankie's kid, give him the nod if anyone looks dangerous walk it was, you don't bother you. Mm. I've jogged twice, one in LA and one in Manc in my life, that's it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so the book, right? So it's, uh, it's out just before the next bunch of Stone Roses gigs. Coincidental, they're, they're doing the, those shows next year. But I've got this thing about, it's been a 30 year trip for me, this, to be truthful, with me, the whole music thing. And it starts with 30 and I'm 60 on the 12th of May next year. Mm. So I'd love it to come out then. And but then it's a month okay. to their gigs. So, so just before the gigs, the book, Steve's book's coming out. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, Steve. Fab.